Hello, and welcome to the Broad Argon Ion Beam Tool for EBSD Preparation Webinar. Today's presenters are Mike Hasselshear and Matt Nowell. Mike is the Product Manager for Specimen Preparation at Catan, and Matt is the EBSD Product Manager at EDEX. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar panel. If we have time at the end, we will ask some questions live. If we don't have time, all questions will be addressed offline in the next week or so. And with that, Mike, please take it away. Okay, thank you, and thank you everyone who's attending. My name is Mike, and I'm responsible for sample prep, which is the most important part of the electron microscopy, as far as I'm concerned. So next slide, Matt, next slide. So there are multiple ways to prepare samples for EBSD. Uh, I think the traditional and probably the most widely used is mechanical prep, maybe followed by electropolish. Um, recently, in say the last five to 10 years, people have been using focused ion beam, uh, originally gallium, FIBs, and now more recently, plasma fibs, mostly, I think, for 3D EBSD. And finally, uh, I've listed here broad argon beam. It could also be called broad ion beam because it is possible to use other ions other than argon. And in the case of GATAN, we have two products, a PEX2 and an ILIAN2, that can be used for preparing samples for EBSD. And the one point I would say also is I view sample prep as, as someone who ha who's required or needs to do it. You need a complete toolbox of a variety of tools because no single tool will do everything you need. Next slide. All right, so this is, I promise, I believe this is the only commercial slide I will show. So our primary tool for EBSD is called PEX, which stands for Precision Etching Coding System, Roman numeral two. Uh, we pre previously had uh, PEX-1 that we sold for about 20 years and PEX-2 came about, out about five years later. The PEX-1 was mainly for sputter coating very high density films for electron microscopy applications. In the PEX-2, we've changed the configuration of the tool because we also saw a big need for EBSD, especially as EBSD has become higher resolution and faster. Uh, it's very easy for us to handle very large areas that are polished. I've, on this slide, I've said uh, four millimeter in radius. It, it actually can be much larger than that, but it's a question of how well the sample was prepared prior to going into the into the PEX-2. Um, another important feature, whether you're doing EBSD or high resolution imaging of any sort or cathode luminescence, is to, be ha is to have repeatability from sample to sample. And I think using an argon or an ion beam tool is really easy to gain that over some of the other techniques. And finally, I think we I pride myself on this. We have a very user interface. We have no icons. Uh, the last thing I enjoy doing is late at night getting into a rental car when it's raining and trying to figure out where the, what the windshield wiper and the light button is. So in our system, there are no icons. And as a result, not only is it easy to use in English, but you can push a button and switch to German, French, Russian, Korean, Japanese, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese. And there's always a button to get you back to English. Next slide. Okay, so given that metallography or mechanical polishing is probably the most widely used way to prepare samples, um, it's not simple to do. It does require skill and patience within the people doing the polishing. And in many cases too, we certainly see it in our lab where people give us samples that they want us to polish cross-sectionally. You may have a thin metal coating that's soft on the uh, interface to a very hard metal, or you may have uh, a sandwich type structure with multiple layers of polymer and metal uh, next to each other. And that makes it hard to prepare purely from a mechanical point of view. Uh, 
Next, it's sometimes uh, in the metallography preparation of samples, you have to use chemicals, including acids, to remove a final damage layer. And um, automated polishing may or may not work all the way down to a complete samples. The last thing is I've seen, and if you go to the Bueller website as an example, you'll see many, many different recipes, even for different versions of steel. So there may be changes that you need to do in a recipe if you have small changes in the material, or even if the weather changes, or if you have two labs and the pH and you're using city water and the pH of the water is different. So it can make it very complicated. Next slide. So just as an example, this is from Bueller, and I, and I just turned it into a, a workflow block diagram of the steps required to polish steel in order to get a sample suitable for EBSD or optical metallography imaging. And it's quite complicated, and it doesn't even show all the details because you have to consider what kind of force and for how long you polish on each step. Uh, what the cloth of the material is, what the slurry is, it, what's in the slurry, is it water or is it some other liquid? So it can become quite a complicated step. So next slide. If you use an argon beam tool, we still need one way or another to shape the sample down to a reasonable size. So that might be a belt grinder or and then maybe a very coarse polishing. And then finally, just a simple polishing step, either one micron diamond or nine micron diamond, and we're done. So next slide. So we take that complicated process and we reduce it to a very few number of steps. It requires much less skill because the fine polishing steps are done with the argon beam tool. It's very reproducible. It's environmentally friendly because we're not using chemicals. And you're never under a fume hood or worrying about uh, breathing some noxious gases or something like that. All right, next slide. Why argon and why broad iron beam? So next slide, please. Argon is one of the noble gases along with xenon and uh, neon. Uh, so it's an inert gas, unlike using gallium in a fib. So we don't have any chemical interaction with um, your material. It has a reasonably high milling rate, a very low damage rate. The cost of the tool itself is probably a factor of 10, less than say a fib, but more than a suite of mechanical polishing tools. And we have a lot of uh, brightness, which means high, high milling rate. But there are some factors you have to consider. So it's an ion, it's accelerated to low energy, but it still can implant into the material or it can cause an amorphization layer. So we have to figure out what are we using for a milling voltage and milling angle that might affect the results and the rate of removal of material. Next slide. So I think this is the heart of the talk I wanted to give today, which is useful even for people who have our argon beam system or one of the three or four competitors that are, that are out there in that uh, th we found this very useful and that it instead of looking at Monte Carlo simulations of electrons, it's for ions, specifically for neon, argon, and xenon at very low energy. So this isn't for high impl implantation energies, but rather from 100 volts to 6 keV. So it's useful for both SEM preparation of samples and also TEM, where people go to much lower energies. And it does it as a function of various angles of the beam to the sample surface. So we had a summer intern one year, a few years back, and we asked him to go through the uh, website and convert this data into something useful. So the next slide. And so this is looking at what the ion penetration depth would be as a function of energy for neon, argon, and xenon. And for SEM work, typically we run between four and six kV, with some of the samples that may have polymers or very, very soft material, we might go down to two or three kV. Uh, whereas in TEM, most likely, especially for FIB, post-FIB cleanup, we would go down to 100 volts or so. So that very far left-hand range is where uh, TEM sample prep is done with an ion beam. 
And what this shows is the lowest ion mass penetrates the deepest, right? The smaller ion will end up going deeper into your sample material. And it also has the largest straggle or spread. And you can see that in that the neon, the error bars are much bigger than xenon where the bars are smaller. So there's gonna be a lot more spreading for better or worse, but it will also penetrate deeper, which may have an impact if you're trying to accurate, accurately measure strain. So you have to think about that for strain. Next slide. The sputtering yield is how much material are you removing? And so this shows the sputtering yield as a function of energy. And it's not intuitive at all at what the best angle is. Obviously, if you are perpendicular to the sample surface, you're just driving the into the sample surface and you'll get very low sputtering yield, sputtered material off. If you go to zero or very close to zero, you're just glancing off the surface and you won't get much sputtering yield. And as you can see, there is a variation in the sputtering yield in the area that's important for SEM work, say as low as 2 kV up to 6 kV or 4 kV to 6 kV, which is what we usually use. So typically we run uh, at angles when we're doing this work between four and, or two and six degrees. Uh, there are reasons to run at higher angles at times because um, the yield or sputtering rate varies as a function of material and also a crystallographic plane that faces the sample surface. So sometimes you would like a little bit of preferential milling because it can actually show you grain boundaries or tilt boundaries or all kinds of things like that without affecting EBSD. So there are reasons maybe that you would run two different angles, a low angle to get a smooth surface and then finish off with a slightly higher angle in order to preferentially etch or sputter etch the surface of the sample. Next slide. Um, so the, the yield obviously varies as a function of the ion, and the heavier the ion, the more the sputter yield. So there's a reason that, for instance, this is the reason why I believe plasma fibs use xenon. They get a higher sputter rate, and given the size of the beam and, and trying to make a big area as they possibly can, they want to use xenon. Now, it turns out that we can use xenon in our tool, and I believe probably so in the other broad argon beam tools. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a slide or two. Next slide. So the other thing you have to think about is the amorphization layer. And again, this is a function of energy. So this is moving the atoms off their preferred location in the lattice. You can actually make an amorphous layer. Um, as you'll see, there's a lot of data on the energy range down below 1 kV. And this is where people are using broad argon beam for making TEM samples, where we typically run down to 100 volts because you want to get the amorphous layer as close to zero as you can. So usually one or two nanometers, which still represents a reasonable percentage of the thickness of your sample, given it might be 20 to 50 nanometers thick for TEM samples but the layer thickness decreases with decreasing beam angle, and also it's smaller for low energy. So um, for that reason, we tend to run at low angle most of the time. Next slide. All right, so how to summarize this? It's a question of science versus business. Uh, hit next. So the highest performance, meaning sputtering versus damage, is not found at the lowest possible energy, what you're trying to get is a balance between sputtering off material and creating new damage, right? So you wanna run certainly above 500 volts and also at angles about 10 degrees or less, and that'll produce the cleanest, lowest damage surface. Next. From all perspectives, xenon is better. Uh, so why are all the companies crazy and selling broad argon beam tools as opposed to broad xenon? beam tools. Uh, the reason is xenon costs 500 to 1,000 times more than argon. Now, in our tools, at least, we have two gas inlets. So you can, and we can calibrate it, so you can run xenon on the guns and argon or dry nitrogen to purge the system and open and close the valves. Opening and closing the valves uses way more of the gas than actually running the guns. Um, and we do have customers that use xenon for mainly when they're using 
uh, in areas where it's a production environment where they want to run samples as fast as possible. Next. Uh, because of the linear behavior in those graphs, which certainly if you uh, want us to send them, just send an email and Parker will make sure you get this presentation. The sputtering rate in amorphous layer thickness varies with energy and you want to get a steady state situation. So as a rule of thumb, it holds that if you, next, if you have the energy, you have the damage layer thickness, but you double the time to remove the layer induced by the higher energy. But you should keep this in mind with our tool or the other tools, because frequently you want to run a recipe, much like you do mechanical polishing, you go from coarse to fine, or on a fib, you go from high voltage to low voltage. So there are times that you may want to run a recipe where you step from a higher accelerating voltage to a lower accelerating voltage, and then maybe even to a higher angle just to do some delineation of the surface. Next slide. Okay, so this, I, it says Gatan on the left. It could actually just say broad argon beam. So many times I've asked to represent that whole community in workshops. And so the advantage of broad argon beam is there are no chemicals or water used. It's an inert gas, so it doesn't interact with the structure, chemical or structural interaction with the sample. It's very easy to prepare multi-phase or multi-layer sample, samples of very dissimilar materials. And the surface quality, or the, yes, the surface quality, meaning the very thin volume that you obtain an EBS signal from, I think Matt will show you, you get very good results with EBSD. And in our system, we also have the ability to sputter coat after polishing the surface. And we do this either because the sample could be an insulator that charges, or just to preserve the surface from oxidation or we're not going to get to the SEM for a while. Okay, Matt, your turn. All right, thanks, Mike, and welcome, everyone. Um, so I'm coming from the EDAC side, where uh, I'm the EBSD product manager. So this, this on the right here just kind of highlights some of the, the key things from, from our product line, where uh, basically we have a number of features designed to, to um, collect high-quality EBSD data, um, but I agree with Mike is that really sample preparation is, is the key. Uh, it doesn't matter what our tools bring. If the sample isn't prepared well, um, downstream, nothing else provides the quality that potentially could be done with a good uh, preparation approach. So I'm going to present uh, results from a, a range of samples. And, and what I want to highlight is that these samples are, are samples we've had trouble with um, from our traditional historical approach of, of preparing samples mechanically. And so generally we've used mechanical preparation um, in our lab and have, have used um, ion beam for, for uh, applications more and more if we become uh, more familiar with the technique and more the things that can be applied. So these are examples of, of, of trickier samples and different types of samples to highlight where uh, the, the PEX and ion beam preparation bring some significant advantages. So the first set I'm gonna use are, have been collected with our Velocity EBSD camera. Uh, this is a series where there's three different uh, uh, variants, the Pro Plus and Super that, that basically provide different speed levels. These are all based off of a, a high speed, low noise CMOS sensor. Uh, that have replaced CCD sensors as the primary tool used for EBSD collection um, and really useful when we want to get uh, in situ and 3D type experiments where collection speed is really critical. That's where we go to the higher and higher speeds. Um, but we can we have a, a range of speeds available depending on, on uh, the type of collection work you're interested in. So the first sample I want to show is it's a multi-phase aluminum alloy. And so this slide shows here uh, on the PEC side, uh, an acceleration voltage of 4 kV, uh, a tilt angle of the gun of 3 degrees and an etching time of 20 minutes. Uh, and then with the velocity, this is a map using 500 nanometer steps, 20 kV acceleration voltage running about 400 points a second and getting a map in you know, about eight minutes. Um, and so showing this, this shows some, uh, some SEM secondary electron images of the sample. This is 
prior to policy with the PECs. Uh, if we look at it horizontally there on the left, uh, you can see we can see the different phases that are present. Uh, but when we tilt it uh, there on the right to 70 degrees for ABSD work, um, that the what's the white phase or, or the, the, the tin phase protrudes and does not give EBSD patterns after traditional polishing. And we can see this here, if we look at the EBSD map that's collected before uh, milling with the PEX, um, we can see on the left that the aluminum uh, in general gives pretty uh, decent patterns, but the patterns for the tin are much weaker and much more diffuse. And if we look at the, the Prius map there in the, the uh, left center, um, for those of you who aren't aware, Prius is an approach of using the, the uh, EBSD phosphor screen uh, as an electron detector. You know, if you think of an electron uh, detector in an SEM, we're just monitoring the signal flux as we raster the beam across. So with this, we specify an area within the center of the phosphor screen uh, as a region of interest, and we monitor the electron flux uh, as we raster the beam to create a signal. And this particular signal um, will emphasize orientation contrast. I'll show some examples a little bit later where you'll see some other contrasts we can see. But what this image shows us is that you can see on those top grains, there's sort of a, a molting effect within the grains. And, and if we compare that to the image on the right, the, the IPF orientation map, uh, this map shows the crystal orientation uh, according to those colored triangles there on the bottom of the map. Uh, and so in those grains, you'll see that the color changes, uh, and that's, that's uh, essentially an artifact um, that, that's occurred um, during the mechanical polishing, and it's orientation dependent. So it's not visible in all the grains, but it's, but it's not representative of the true uh, microstructure of the material. And in addition to this, we can see that the, um, the tin particles uh, are much more just speckled colors. That's where we're not getting reliable indexing. Um, and so we can see that there's also additional deformation that has occurred next to these particles. And as we're trying to mechanically polish it, you know, the, the, there's a differential polishing rate between the two materials. So we're getting deformation. We can see that deformation as uh, a, a rolling variation of the colors uh, shown in that IPF map. And so if we look at this now, after the 20 minutes of ion milling, again, looking at it on the left, we see a, a, a nice clear visual representation of the microstructure. Um, the tin grains now are smooth. If we look at it when we tilt it, in this case, to 45 degrees to show it, the, the darker grains, the silicon grains are etched a little bit and, and are, are recessed slightly down. Uh, but we can still get patterns from them, but it's a much, much more uh, useful surface when we look at the improvement of the EBSD pattern. So now, um, you know, the aluminum is, is now much uh, sharper and we're getting much better uh, EBSD patterns from the tin phase uh, as well. And so if we look at our Prius center map now, now those aluminum grains, that molting has gone away. And if we look at the orientation map, the, the aluminum grains are, are solid colors as we would expect for this material. And the, the tin and silicon grains are giving useful diffraction patterns. You'll see there's not uh, the speckling we saw in the earlier ones. So we're now getting uh, much higher indexing rates for all the phases. And this is, I think, a really important example, um, especially for things like aluminum alloys, where often the mechanical polishing focuses on the, on the, on the primary matrix phase and it is harder to get usable EBSD patterns from the, the, the secondary phases. And oftentimes in a lot of your, your real world samples, there are these secondary phases that are present. And so the ion beam uh, preparation allows us to get useful diffraction data uh, from those. And of course, we can also um, collect simultaneous EDS, EDS data with the EBSD data. So essentially we can better fully characterize the entire microstructure and have that available for, for subsequent analysis. And this is just an example, um, kind of a transition zone from uh, where it was mechanically polished to where it's just mechanically polished. You can see the, the, the difference from left to right where the molting is present on the left. Uh, once it's iron polished, it's no longer present. We see a much clearer microstructure 
and the Prius images show that um, that clear microstructure as well. So um, the, the PEX2 doing much better. The next example I want to show is a uh, zinc aluminum alloy. Again, very similar type of an approach with the 4KV three degree glancing angle, um, but a little bit longer time, 120 minutes. The velocity again, sub micron, 400 nanometer steps, 20 KV, 500 points, and a, a larger map, about 3 million points in an hour and a half. And so if we look at it before polishing, uh, you can see it's a it's a very uh, complicated looking microstructure when we look at it this way. The zinc grains are bright, but the zinc aluminum eutectic mixtures are dark in the structure. And there are many pores that are present that are difficult to tell after mechanical polishing. And this is just due to the strong difference in polishing rates uh, between the two different phases. So uh, some of the grains get pulled out, they scratch the surface. And essentially, no EVSD patterns were obtained after a, a traditional uh, approach. So we thought this would be a really good uh, candidate for PEX polishing. So after that 120 degree, uh, 120 minute milling, and again, so we were starting with a with a pretty rough surface with a little, with a lot of topography. So we milled it longer. In this case, now the zinc grains are bright, uh, and the matrix grains and the eutectic grains are now visible. Um, you can see those the, the structures where the eutectic's visible in the structure, and the aluminum grains are now small, rounded, uh, dark areas. And now we can start to see more of the pores in the cavities and some along the grain boundaries. So now we have a sample that gives nice uh, EVSD patterns, and we can go ahead and collect a map from those regions. This is just an example, again, kind of showing um, the, the uh, the transition from the, the optimized milling on the left um, to more towards the, the outer radius on the right. Um, but the EBSD patterns could be obtained across the full field of view. It's just, you can kind of see the, the, the stitching there. There's a five by three uh, montage together of a large area to show that transition. Uh, but we could map across that full field of view. And this just shows it here. Um, this shows the the EBSD image quality map here on the left. Uh, the image quality map is just basically derived by measuring the contrast and brightness and sharpness of the diffraction bands within each pattern and scaling that across a, a grayscale region. Uh, so we see the microstructure, the grain structure uh, within the image quality map. We see the representative patterns there are very nice where before uh, we weren't getting any patterns, nothing usable at all. So a, a huge change. And we can see how this corresponds to, again, the simultaneously collected chemistry. So we see an EDS map showing the aluminum uh, compositional distri distribution. So we can see where the aluminum rift regions are. Uh, we can see here taking this same map and now showing the orientations. Here the orientations are showing the colors with there's the zinc uh, uh, stereographic triangle for color key. So we see we're measuring the orientations very well um, for, for the different phase regions. And so that's just an example, again, of, of a sample that we couldn't see anything to begin with. Uh, and then after you know, 120 minutes of IMB polishing, we're getting you know, full characterization. The third sample I wanna show is, is a magnesium alloy. Uh, magnesium is one that's been traditionally difficult to prepare mechanically in our lab. Um, part of that is, is magnesium can be difficult. Part of that is that um, we've just done mechanical without any uh, chemicals beyond colloidal silica. So magnesium um, is one of those examples that can use special etchings to try to bring something out. It can be very temperamental to get results. So this shows here for the, for the PEX results, um, started with a 5 kV, five degree glancing for 10 minutes and then follow that up with 5 kV at four degree glancing for 30 minutes. Um, and, and part of the reason again is just what we were starting with. I'll we'll show some examples of that. Uh, and then on the EBSD side, you know, this is one and a half micron or 100, uh, 1500 nanometer step size, 15 kV, 900 points a second. Again, a, a pretty large map, about 7 million points. Um, this shows the sample before polishing. And so this is one, again, this is one we just had uh, 
in the drawer saying this is something we weren't able to get good results from uh, how we received the sample weren't able to do anything so it had been mechanically polished a long time ago and had been sitting in in air and oxidizing for a long period of time so we, when we checked it out initially we didn't get any diffraction patterns so went ahead started doing our pecs um, the the low magnif magnification image there on the left shows where the the oxide layer has been removed so that's a at a, a, a low mag tilted view uh not tilt corrected so you can see it and then we look at it the higher magnification there on the right um we can see that we have some uh topography that's been induced from the milling but we can also see that the the initial mechanical preparation uh wasn't great we can still see some residual scratches that were present in the surface uh, that we're able to detect. But we can look at the structure uh, as is. So kind of looking at the left, the image quality map here, we see uh, what we saw on this, the screen. We start to see the grain structure that's, approved, that's uh, apparent. We can see those scratches that are present throughout the sample. Uh, in the orientation map, we can see uh, we're getting orientation data across the whole field of view. Um, you can see that it's a, it's a pretty large field of view. It's two and a half by five and a half millimeters. Um, and we see in some cases that the, um, that the, 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 the original scratches are still present. That the, the, the um, you know, generally for a sample like this would say we would want to do a, a, a better or a fresh mechanical polish as Mike showed on his, on his uh, workflow to, to do that. But we do see that even taking something that, that has residual damage, we're still getting nice diffraction patterns. And we can see with the Prius, um, this shows the, the three different contrasts. So we're looking bottom on the left, center in the middle, and top on the right. Um, the Prius bottom generally will show more topographical contrast. We see that sort of looks like what we were seeing in the, uh, in the SEM image. The center shows orientation contrast. You can see how that contrast corresponds to the colored uh, orientation IPF map. And then the top uh, map on the right shows uh, atomic number contrast. And that generally shows that we generally are looking at more of a, of a single phase magnesium sample. And the representative patterns show that uh, even though some residual deformation are present, we get patterns that are clearly usable and indexable. And that's why we see the orientation map uh, has a lot of, of uh, data available. Uh, the next sample I want to show is a is a is a cobalt chrome iridium alloy. Um, this one again, we used a two step process for for PEX. So started at six kV for four uh, four degree glancing for ten minutes, and then dropping down to five kV four degree glancing for twenty minutes. With the velocity looking at 20, uh, 200 nanometer steps, twenty kV, hundred points a second, uh, for just under a million points. In this one here, this shows the optical images that are available from the PEX2, uh, looking at the start condition uh, after the 6 kV uh, etch and after the 4 kV etch. Uh, you can start to see that we start to see some of the grain structure uh, a little bit more visibly here uh, as we etch a little bit more and more. If we look at the, um, the uh, secondary electron images here, uh, before PEX2 and after the final uh, there on the right, you can see that we start to see uh, a little bit more um, highlighting around the boundaries of some of the secondary phases as it, as it gets to there. You can see that the grain structure starts to uh, show a little bit more contrast there on the right. And if we look at it now, backscatter detector after tilting, basically we see we can see the structure, but you can see that um, we see the atomic number contrast nicely there. And then if we look at the images, um, this is tilting here before PEX. Um, you can see there's a lot of topography. The forward scatter detector is, is sensitive to topography that we don't see as much with the secondary electron image there on the right. So we, it highlights that. That's why the Prius bottom image, both the forward scatter detector and the Prius bottom image are towards the bottom of the detector. So the electrons that are being backscattered uh, are, are uh, passing you know, towards the surface of the sample. So topography can attenuate the signal more uh, than we'll see with other detectors. But if we look at it now after um, 
etching, we can see that we're we're starting to see more of the grain structure there in the FSD image. Uh, the BSE image that we saw earlier, we, we see the structure uh, start to, to come out a little bit more. But the important thing now is, is for the, um, the EBSD results. So again, the image quality there on the left, we see uh, a wide range of different contrasts. We see that the, uh, the larger, darker particles are, are secondary phases. And within the interior of the grains, we see lots of, of linear features that um, at first pass, we, we would, would maybe want to call twins, but I'll, I'll show some results that show they aren't. But the, the important thing, if we look at the orientation map on the right, a um, couple of things I want to point out is that there, there are uh, four different phases that are being represented. So, uh, you know, it can be a little bit hard to interpret this map where we're, we're overlaying all four orientation maps together when the colors can represent different things. Um, of course, within the analysis software, you can strip those out and show those individually, but to, to just show that across the board, though, the entire field of view is giving orientation information that we can index. And then we can see with the phase map, those darker particles were the, 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 uh, the blue phase there. Uh, there's a small yellow tantalum, uh, tantalum cobalt phase that's present. And then there's a, uh, uh, a phase transformation between a cubic and a hexagonal uh, phase that is causing those linear things. So it's, it's a, a mid-transform type of a sample. And we can see, uh, that's kind of weird. Don't, I don't know where the patterns went on that. Um, the the Prius image on the, uh, the 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 top part there, which is the bottom image, shows the atomic number contrast. The middle image there shows the Prius in the middle, where it's orientation contrast, and the Prius image on the top shows the the topographical contrast. Now, we're also going to show a result. Uh, those have all shown our our velocity cameras. I uh, want to show some results from our Hikari super camera. Uh, this is a CCD based camera uh, that its alpha speeds up to 1500, 1400 points per second. Uh, very similar in terms of how the indexing engine works though with the velocity. It's mainly just, this is a, an older camera based on CCD technology. And so this is using, looking at a, a, an amalgam sample here. Again, using a 6 kV uh, two degree glancing for 90 minutes, uh, followed up with a Hikari 70 nanometer steps, 20 kV, 100 points a second, uh, about a million data points collected. So this is a sample that was looked at without any initial preparation, very topographic. Uh, looking at it with the backscatter detector, there's, it's hard to recognize any individual phases or structure. And there were no EBSD patterns that were obtained uh, as on the as received sample. So after that PEX approach, looking at the, the sample under equivalent uh, conditions, um, we can see you start to see the, uh, we've smoothed out the surface significantly. You can start to see the, um, the, the microstructure, the grain structure that's apparent after the PEX preparation. And this shows the same thing now with, um, the, with the backscatter detector. So we start to see these, these spherical particles here. You can see some of the grain structure present uh, after, the, after the, um, the, the ion milling. And showing on the left, this, that's the secondary electron image. Uh, on the left, again, you can see those spherical uh, type of the features within the microstructure. And that's the EBSD image quality on the right. So you can see the image quality reveals a lot of the detail. Those spherical particles sort of have a center region where you can see the grain structure, uh, a transition region at the outer uh, uh, outer diameter or circumference of the uh, of those particles. Within the interior, the bright areas, you can see there's a pretty complex grain structure, um, lots of of uh, different grain sizes, different grain shapes. Um, so it's it's a pretty interesting uh, interesting microstructure. Looking at it now, looking at the orientation maps, you can see there's a few different phases: a mercury silver, a copper tin, a copper silver phase uh, that are that are detected. We can we can resolve those different grains um, and their grain orientation. See if there's a preferred orientation. 
And this shows the, the phase map distribution. So you can see the red, green, and yellow phases. That's combined uh, in, in a single map. And we can compare that to the Prius images. Again, the Prius top image there shows sort of the atomic number contrast. So um, the Prius center shows the orientation contrast. And the Prius bottom shows a little bit more of the topography. And you can see for the different phases, uh, some of the different patterns. So we're getting patterns from, from uh, all the different phases that are present. And going up to a higher magnification, this is going along the rim of one of those spherical particles, um, resolving the very fine features. So you can see um, th there are some, some, some small grains that are present uh, along the edge of those spheres uh, in the material. And this shows it for each phase separately. Uh, and so you can kind of see there the, the larger grains on the left, the fine grains in the middle, and then some very tiny ones that are on the right that are along part of the rim and then on the outer part of the structure. So the ion beam was able to help us go from a, a surface we got nothing to be able to resolve very fine features. The next sample I want to show is a zinc alloy with a copper coating. Again, used a two-step of approach of you know, starting at 5 kV, uh, 30 minutes at three degree glancing angle, then going to four kV and three degrees for 60 minutes. Uh, again, with the Hakari Super, 100 nanometer steps, 150 points a second uh, for about a half an hour. And so this is interesting uh, in that the mechanical polishing, the, the surface looked pretty good, but sample oxidation prevented collection of good EBSD patterns. Uh, and so this looks before uh, or after the, the PEX2 imaging. Uh, so there's two different parts of the microstructure we're interested in. There's the edge we see on the left. So we have our, our alloy there and then the, the coating on the edge. And then in the center there, um, the left image shows the, uh, the different layers that we can visualize within the plating. Uh, and we can see that some of the mechanical um, polishing, there's a few residual scratches that are present we can see in the backscattered image. So this is looking at the uh, the patterns from the just the matrix zinc phase. Uh, we see nice patterns, we see nice orientation maps. Uh, that all is is uh, resolved you know clearly and nicely. And so again, we use this here wanting to go to the um, the Hakari conditions are going down to 30 nanometer step sizes uh, to resolve some very fine structure, looking at the coating in general. So this is looking along the edge of the coating, uh, selecting that area. You can see we have the original image quality map there on the right. And then we have what we call the reprocessed image quality map. So we've done some uh, image processing we call MPAR to try to enhance the signal to noise to, to resolve those very fine grains. So that's what we see here. So the image quality map shows a very fine grain structure on the left-hand side of that coating. As we get near the interface to the zinc, we see that the grains start to be uh, a little larger. And you can also see there starts to be some uh, directional growth for how the um, how the how it was plated onto the sample. So it, it, it starts with large growth and then tends towards more of a of a, a finer grain structure. We can see the phase map where we see where the zinc and copper phases are. Uh, we can see the orientations there with the Prius contrast. So we get a nice uh, characterization of that coating. Coatings are often very difficult to prepare mechanically for two different reasons. One, uh, differential polishing rates between the, the two different phases, and two, uh, rounding of the sample uh, as you're trying to polish it when the, when the sample stops at the edge of the coating. So wanted to give a number of different examples and to kind of summarize things. Um, you know, the PEX2, it's a, it's a broad, eye, broad beam ion build tool that's a really a versatile tool uh, to prepare the sample for EBSD work and can be used on a, on a wide range of samples. Uh, I hope I showed a, a range of samples that are, were difficult to do traditionally. Uh, as Mike said, it's, it's very easy to operate and it's very effective to, to look at things that have oxidized, have deformation, have, uh, irregular surfaces to get to a surface we can do good EBSD work on. Uh, and it can be used on, on what we call difficult materials. So strained, soft, porous, multi-phase materials. Um, and we can look at large areas. Uh, and it, it doesn't take expert knowledge to be able to, uh, to get these results. It's, it's basically a, 
uh, an easy push button tool to um, to get the results you need. So with that, I'll I'll say thank you and hand it over to Parker for a minute. Thank you very much, um, both Matt and Mike. We do have a lot of questions, but we're running a little short on time. So um, first question for you, Matt, um, how do you place and position the sample into the PECs? So there, there's kind of two steps for it. You know, we, it works with, uh, it's about an inch and a quarter um, uh, stub size of a, of a platen when you put the sample on and you you position your sample so that it's centered on that stub uh, and so um, you know metallographically if you're using that size mount you just you put it on that stub and the beads automatically centered if it's a smaller sample than that you you, you position it just you position the area of interest uh, along the center kind of marked with a crosshair and then there's a, a laser height tool we use to adjust the height so that the um, the sample plane of interest is correctly positioned so that the, the gun tilt uh, attacks that sample area precisely and correctly to make it very efficient. And so it's kind of a two-step process and, and pretty easy. Mike, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think he covered it. Um, you can obviously, if the area of interest, especially when people have um, a sample mounted in Bakelite, but it's a thin sample and they've stood it upright, you, you can off-center the sample on the holder so that the area of interest is in the center. But um, there's a lot of flexibility in, in how you mount the sample. Okay, next question. Um, how large of an area can you polish for EBSD with an argon beam tool like the PEX? Yeah, that that's a fun question to try to answer because <laughs> it varies. Uh, the biggest reason it varies is because it depends, as Matt showed on a couple examples, how well the sample has been prepared before you put it in the PEX. So if, it's, if, if it looks like somebody just dragged the sample down the highway, it, it's hard to get a huge area, but typically we can get at least five millimeters in radius, so maybe 10 millimeters as, he sh as Matt shows there. Um, there are ways to make it bigger too. So for instance, we have two beams on our system and you can align them so that they are not aligned to the same point. There are, you offset them by maybe up to a beam or two beam diameters. And secondly, we can defocus the beam, which is very, very useful. Uh, so I've seen cases where we've gotten very good results up to say 20 millimeters in diameter. And that's become more important as the EBSD detectors have become faster and faster. Anything to add, Mike? Mike, Matt? No, I think that covers it really well. Okay. Um, next one. Can you prepare lithium battery materials for EBSD? And how would you do that? Yeah, we, we have two ways. One is um, a more expensive version of the tool where we add a, we have an airlock on the, on the PEX tube, but we add a second airlock. And when we load the samples, um, you could load it manually from air into the system. But when we take it out, we transfer it into a transfer pod, backfilling with argon as opposed to vacuum, since you keep the surface free of then oxygen, and then into a glove box, and then one way or another into your SEM, or we also offer our own airlock for the SEM that allows us to transfer the transfer pod onto the SEM under an argon vacuum or atmosphere, then transfer through the airlock into the SEM and then maybe back out again. That's the main way people do it. A few people use the sputter coating in the system to put a platinum layer or gold layer on the surface, which seems to be okay for some period of time. So certainly if you prepare the sample on the PEX and go right over to the SEM, you probably, it'll work fine. Okay, we, we're getting so many good questions. Um, we are not gonna be able to answer all of them. So I'm just gonna do one more. Um, if you do have questions, please enter them in. We will get to them offline um, within the next week. Um, last question, um, can you use the PEX to smooth a thin film for EBSD analysis? Yes, yes. So it, it becomes a little tricky 
be trickier, and I, I didn't mention it just because it may not be so obvious for people, but um, if you mean a sample thin, meaning it's a couple millimeters thick, what we want to do then is normally the gun, we have two guns, they're situated 120 degrees apart, and we rotate the sample 360 degrees and the guns are on all the time. In the case of a thin strip, we would set up, we call them vector angles, so we don't mill or polish across the, the edges of the sample. So we would only do perhaps 240 of the 360 degrees as it rotates around, and it would automatically do that. Or sometimes people put a sacrificial layer like a glass slide on, on the side of the surface uh, that may be soft. Matt, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, my experience with it has gone to, I've looked at, you know, some thin, like photovoltaic uh, samples that are pretty rough when initially deposited and when used just a, a couple of degrees glancing, four or five, six degrees and get really nice surfaces after. So even when the even when the films are pretty, um, you know, thin, can, can smooth them yeah. off and make it work. So let me add another point to that. So as I think Matt showed some examples where the sample surface is rough and you would wonder when we do we actually accentuate the hillux or do we remove them and one of the graphs I showed that is the milling rate is or sputter rate is higher for higher angles so it turns out it works to your advantage that when you have these rough surfaces that are at different angles it'll polish the hills down Yeah, I think it's been a it's been a good approach for things where you couldn't even you wouldn't even think about trying to touch it up on a polishing cloth of it. So yeah, yeah. That it's, you, but this this you can control very nicely. And with that, I want to thank you, Matt, and I want to thank you, Mike, for giving such a wonderful webinar. Um, again, we will answer your questions that you have put through um, offline, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.